Good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? No. Good evening. Good. All right. That's good. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Norman Burnett, I'm Assistant Dean and Director of the Office of Minority Student Affairs here at the University of Rochester. And on behalf of the Martin Luther King Jr. Planning Committee, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to the 2023 Martin Luther King Jr. Commemorative Address. The address is co-sponsored by the Office of the President and the College's Office of Minority Student Affairs in partnership with the Institutional Office of Equity and Inclusion and the Office of Alumni Relations and Constituent Engagement. The commemorative address was series was established in 2001. Its core goal was to honor Dr. King's legacy by hearing timely commentary from distinguished civil rights leaders, activists, scholars, journalists, and artists. Today, the overarching goal of, that seri of the series remains true to its original mission. That is to elevate discussions about diversity, freedom, civil rights, and social justice in a public and open forum. The annual address provides our students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends of the greater Rochester community the opportunity to engage with individuals who share important perspectives on some of the most compelling issues of our time. For, the, for more than two decades, we have been extremely fortunate in attracting an impressive array of speakers to the series. This year is no different in that respect. However, the format of the annual address has been modified. As opposed to a single speaker addressing our audience, we are privileged to have two academic scholars distinguished in their respective fields address the intersections of race, religion, and politics and their influence on the historical and current cultural landscape. The discussion will be moderated by our very own director of the Frederick Douglass Institute, Dr. Jeffrey McCune. We are also celebrating 10 year anniversary of the Frederick Douglass House, better known as DLH, a vibrant, yes. DLH is a vibrant living learning community where students of all backgrounds come together and raise awareness of the many facets of the black experience. So I am so pleased that our distinguished speakers this evening and Dr. McCune were able to hold a Q&A session with student leaders in the Douglas Leadership House this afternoon. I heard it was very engaging and a robust and wide ranging set of topics were discussed. So we thank you for spending time with our students. So again, I'll be sure, I just wanna say welcome. We look forward to hearing from our distinguished guests and we appreciate your joining us uh, this evening in person as well as virtually. And at this time, it is my privilege and in my honor to introduce the president of the University of Rochester, Dr. Sarah Mangelsdorf, who, who has been a steadfast supporter of the MLK series. She will offer a welcome remark on behalf of the university community. Dr. Mangelsdorf. I understand there are a number of people on the Zoom who are Zooming in for this event. So it's, it's nice to see all of you here tonight. And thank you, Norm, and for our co-host today, the Office of Minority Student Affairs, the Institutional Office of Equity and Inclusion, and the Office of Alumni Relations and Constituent Engagement. We're really grateful for the work that all of you do for the university, especially for our students. It's truly an honor to welcome everyone here to the University of Rochester's 22nd celebration honoring the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. His legacy in Rochester stretches back 65 years, almost to the day when on January 7th, 1958, Dr. King last visited our city. Even before then, he would have certainly appreciated Rochester's longtime home and resting place of two of the nation's most impactful Americans, abolition, abolitionist author and crusading journalist Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony, who led the suffrage movement to empower women. Perhaps no one has so elevated their work for equity inclusion more than Dr. King. And that's one of the reasons why we celebrate Dr. King today. I am proud that our university shares Dr. King's fundamental commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, though you will hopefully, I think our, our speakers with us Tonight, we'll talk about their experiences here when they were assistant professors um, and the work we still have to do. So um, 
I'm, I'm just being, I, I not, I'm not saying it's all a bed of roses, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, as Norm mentioned, the University of Rochester has hosted some of the nation's highest profile leaders in the areas of diversity, civil rights, and social justice as our MLK speakers to reflect on Dr. King's legacy. These speakers have included such people as Martin Luther King III, Mary Frances Berry, Jesse Jackson, Andrew Young, you know, you, you know these names. These are great people, and we have great people with us here tonight. These individuals devoted their lives to advocating for basic rights and have been an inspiration for all of us to do, be better and do better. And we have taken that message to heart. And I, certainly since, since coming here, I have, and Provost Figlio uh, shares my view at this, we are continuing to seek ways to educate and foster an inclusive culture on our campus and in the broader world. And there are a few examples of things that have happened just in the past few years. Um, we started Rochester's Equity and Access Leadership Conversations Lecture Series, Real Conversations. We actually started them during COVID because people could then zoom in from all over the country, and it was really very interesting. And it's designed to provide an opportunity for very authentic discussions and candid dialogues around equity, measurable action, and meaningful change. This monthly virtual session series is available on our university's advancement website. It's open to all. The next program will be February 8th and it's on the anatomy of hate and its impact on health, which I'm sure will be an interesting session. And our Office of Alumni Relations launched Alumni Affinity Networks just three years ago to strengthen ties of our black alumni, our female alumni, first generation alumni with our university. And our Black Alumni Affinity Group has been particularly successful um, connecting, currently has all over 500 members, and they are really feeling more connected and being honest about what their experiences were like when they were here. Um, on our campus, at our medical center, just this year, we opened up a new office of health equity research to, to help all of our departments pursue health equity research and to ensure that all of what we're doing at the medical center is viewed through a health equity lens. And to just wanna do a plug for our annual presidential Stronger as One Diversity Awards that we're having on March 2nd to honor faculty, staff, students, trustees, and members of the greater Rochester community who are actively working to make the University of Rochester and the city of Rochester a welcoming and inclusive environment. Those are just a few examples of things we're trying to do to foster an inclusive climate, but we do recognize that in, as an institution, we have much more to do. I'm not trying to say that everything is perfect just because we've made some progress on some things. And as we've been developing our new strategic plan for the future of the university, we've been very intentional about making sure diversity, equity, inclusion are core principles of the plan. And you'll all learn more about that as we <laughs> unveil it next month <laughs> and start telling everyone about it. Uh, many people in this room have been involved in that process. We are deeply committed to further diversifying our student body, our faculty, and our staff. And we are building, and this may sound like a non sequitur, but we're building a new academic financial model that will help us facilitate those objectives. Now, this is what Dr. King dreamt of, a nation where his children and his children's children would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. So tonight, I hope we all dream, as King did, to be the kind of university and the kind of world that sees character, not color, and celebrates humanity, not hatred. It's now my tremendous pleasure to introduce to today's moderator, Jeffrey Kuhn, the director of the Frederick Douglass Institute for African and African American Studies at the University of Rochester. An award-winning scholar who's been a featured art guest on radio programs and podcasts, I recently learned that Professor McCune actually began his career as an 11-year-old giving Dr. King speeches around the nation. I asked him who his agent was, he says his mom. Um, so to light, tonight, we are delighted to have him moderate what I'm sure will be a riveting conversation. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey McCune. And if you want to, you can recite part of one of uh, Dr. King's speeches. Because <laughs> I know you have them all memorized.
I will not be reciting. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jahari Don Hemphill. Um, my family is currently in Fairfax, but I'm a military child, so I've moved around a lot. And I'm part of the class of 2025. I am double majoring in international relations and Latin American studies and minoring in economics. And I'm currently the secretary for the Douglas Leadership House. And when I graduate from U of R, I wanna pursue my passions in development, specifically improving policy and programming um, for the Latin American, Latin American region, whether it's becoming a foreign service officer in the state department or working for NGOs. And tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Valeria Sinclair Chapman. Dr. Valeria Sinclair Chapman is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for Research on Diversity and Inclusion at Purdue University. Her work focuses on American political institutions, legislative politics, minority representation in Congress, and minority political participation. Broadly construed, her research examines why and how previously marginalized groups gain inclusion in the American political system. Dr. Sinclair Chapman has previously served on the American Political Science Association Council and as co-president of the Race, Ethnicity, and Politics section. She is currently co-editor of the American Political Science Review, Discipline's flagship journal, and a co-director of the Institute for Civically Engaged Research. She teaches courses on race and ethnic politics, African-American politics, political representation, Black political leadership, Congress as an Institution, and Introduction to American Politics. Professor Sinclair Chapman is author or co-author of articles in the journal Politics, Electoral Studies, Political Research Quarterly, and Politics Groups and Identities, as well as the author of several book chapters in an award-winning book titled Countervailing Forces in African-American Political Activism, 1973 through 1994. Please welcome the beautiful and intelligent Dr. Valeria Sinclair Chapman. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paris Jameson, and I'm from Long Island, New York. I'm a junior here at the University of Rochester. My majors are political science and Japanese, and my minors are Chinese and comparative literature. Um, I am currently the fundraising chair of the Equestrian Club, and I'm a representative in the Presidential Advisory Committee, and this is my second year as DLH historian. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anthea Butler. Dr. Anthea Butler is a professor in American Social Thought and chair of the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Butler's research and writing spans African-American religion and history, race, politics, evangelicalism, gender and sexuality, media, and popular culture. Professor Butler's courses include Religion from Civil Rights to Black Lives Matter, Religion in the African Diaspora, God and Money, Religion and American Politics, and Ritual and Practice in Religious Studies. As an author, her most recent book is White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Professor Butler is the 2022 winner of the Martin E. Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion, given by the American Academy of Religion. She was also a presidential fellow at Yale Divinity School and was awarded a grant to investigate, investigate prosperity gospel and politics in the American and Nigerian context. Dr. Butler currently serves as president of the American Society for Church History and is also a member of the American Academy of Religion, American Historical Association, and the International Communications Association. Professor Butler is a commentator and an opinion writer for MSNBC, and her articles have also been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, NBC, and The Guardian. Please welcome Dr. Anthea Butler. <laughs> Let's give it up for the students. Amazing. Without being said, we have brilliant, wonderful students here at the University of Rochester. 
It is my pleasure to host this conversation with two of my dear old friends uh, and to have a good time talking race, religion, and politics. And we're just gonna get the party started. So, Drs. Butler and Chapman. <laughs> when we think back to the mid 20th century and we think about race, religion, and politics, what was happening? What was the relationship? How would you describe Dr. King's moment and, and that moment of race, religion, politics? Like, what were the tensions? What were, what were the things that you would say we need to be thinking about today? Well, it depends on where you want to start with Dr. King. Do you want to start with 1954 and the Montgomery bus boycott and going forward? Do you want to start in the 60s? Where would you like to start? So I always like to start at the beginning. So let me take this as a religious historian. King actually spoke and gave a prayer when Billy Graham was at um, in New York for a series of crusades. He had him come up and do this prayer to open up the meeting. By the time 1963 came, Billy Graham was denouncing, you heard me, denouncing the March on Washington. Why is that? The civil rights movement was never just this movement about Jim Crow. This is also a movement about exposing the racism in American Christianity. And so when we talk about King, we can't just talk about this nice story. The story that you want to hear is the story that is on the wall of the Bible Museum in DC. There's a picture of Billy Graham on one side and King on the other as though they were friends. They were not. When King was assassinated, Billy Graham was overseas playing golf. And he just kind of went, oh, you know, I don't have a lot to say about this, right? But you should understand that religious people in America, both those who were white and those who were black, did not care for King. This is not some simple story about how we like to think about the end of the speech at the March on Washington, the I Have a Dream speech. It's not just about character. What it is is about a debt a debt that African-Americans like Martin Luther King always had to call to from the black church in order to hold white Christians and America to account. And so when we talk about this, we have to realize that the violence that came with the civil rights movement, the lynchings, the burnings, the bombings, the dogs, the hoses, mm -hmm. these are not people who are not Christian, they were Christians. They went to church every Sunday. They were nice, good Southern Baptists, <laughs> just like Billy Graham. And so the scene that I want to put in front of you is not the scene that you always get now, because the king that you get is a sanitized king. It's not the king who just said one lofty speech. It was the king that continued to call America to account that America had written us a, blank, a bad check mm -hmm. marked insufficient funds. And so when we talk about this, we have to realize that religion in America, and especially Christianity, was complicit in the racial structures and the racism and the Jim Crow and the violence and all the things that not just King experienced, but everybody who marched, who sat at a lunch counter, who went down south to go register somebody to vote and ended up like Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman dead. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> In a nutshell. I, I mean, you just want to, you want to talk about the scene. But, and, um, Anthony, I'm actually gonna, gonna kind of take a, a point from you to kind of think about which King are we talking about? I think exactly. that that is a really important thing. Mm -hmm. So King in 1954 was a young preacher, yes. right? And when, um, long before, when, we, when they started um, in 1955, inspired by the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision, Right again, that that struck down separate but equal, which was a law of the land since 1896, since Plessy versus Ferguson. Right, and so this is a remarkable moment that inspires people across the country, and certainly inspire people in Montgomery, Alabama. And so when Rosa Parks sat down, who had been trained at, at Highlander School in Tennessee. She was not, she was an activist in the NAACP, right? So when Rosa Parks said that she would not get up on the seat, and let me just tell you, that bus story that we have 
like I'm, 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 I'm too tired or I'm, whatever that is. It wasn't that at all. It was that um, on those buses, when more, when more whites got on it, you could be sitting in the black section of the bus. Black people got on the back of the bus, whites got on at the front of the bus. You could be in the black section, but if more whites got on, you had to stand up because a white person could not sit across the aisle from a black person. All of the black people had to move back. And so when Rosa Parks refused to stand up, what they were actually pushing for was a more reasonable segregation. That is the black section should belong to the black people mm -hmm. and the other section could belong to you. But what happened in that moment was that it ignited a movement locally. Dr. King was the new kid on the block. He was the least controversial of all the pastors. He was a young pastor at that time. And he was thrust into this movement. He had been preparing, right? He, he was ready for the moment, but he, and, and the black church. So it's not only a time of what is happening with King, it is what is happening in these, it's a tale of two churches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The black church became a place, a site of, of, of rejuvenation and invigoration and movement songs and people met regularly to keep the movement going. It was required. You needed that counter public. You needed that space where these people could come together. That was the black church, right? The white church, on the other hand, was, were those who were saying, but you work for me and this is good. And I'm, we're going to come and pick you up, but you cannot, we cannot be equals. We cannot socially be um, on riding these. We can't have equal transportation and all of these things, right? And so the white church was doing what it did and the black church was doing its work. And it was transformative in Montgomery. But if we move forward, then we do see a king who is now moving forward. The nation is moving forward. He's calling on the nation in 1963 to do something different, hearkening back to 1954 and to the promise of the change that could happen and still running into roadblocks. But even in the 1960s, you saw white parishioners who were coming down. There was a push for the social gospel, which I hope that we can talk about, who were white Catholics. Um, Jewish uh, um, 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 leaders, rabbis, um, Muslims, all of these coming down to work in the South to actually change the nature and the tenor of this country. And by the time that King was assassinated in 1968, we had been through so much, but he was moving towards labor in the Poor People's Campaign, again, imbued with a moral authority that this nation had to be called to live up to its own ideals. And it's not so different, frankly, than what Frederick Douglass would have said, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That this nation can actually live up to its own constitutional values. And so we don't walk away, we engage. And I think it's a tale of two churches and in, in more than one king over time. So one of the things I'm thinking about is, as we think about white violence, mm -hmm. How is white violence connected to the church? Hmm. Right? Because we always think about white violence as some kind of secular, right, activity. I'm wondering about the relationship between white violence and white evangelical Christianity. Yeah, I, you know, this is one of those topics where, you know, when I talk to evangelicals, they say, well, you know, we were abolitionists. We didn't like slavery. We did missionary work. We did all that. I'm like, yeah, that's true. But there's another story. Mm -hmm. There's another story about, you know, white masters who rape their, you know, enslaved women. There's the story about um, the KKK, the beginnings of the KKK in the 1870s and when it was struck down by the government the first time around. Who was there? Pastors. They burned black churches. They burned black churches in the second round of the KKK, 1950s, 1915 forward. But the other part of this is about how you think about theological things. I don't say that word theology very much because I'm a religious studies person, but I think you need to understand that if you are embedded in an institution that says that black people were another kind of creation, because you read the second creation story and you say, oh, this must be the creation story about white people. Then that first creation story was a mess. And so black people aren't really, aren't really real people. They're something else. They're three fifths of a person or they're animals or they get descended from something else. Then we need to begin to interrogate the kinds of things that white Christians say today and not just in the civil rights movement because you have people today who wanna say interracial marriage is wrong. They base that on biblical belief. They base the violence on biblical belief because they don't believe in race mixing. 
And this is part of what's happening in the 1950s with King, because you got the Citizens Council, which, you know, I have my students do this exercise in my class to have them look through the Citizens Council's newspapers that you need to get from the University of Mississippi. They are online. And I have them go and pick out all the articles about clergy members who are opposing integration mm -hmm. and opposing Brown v. Board. And there's tons of them. Why do you hear all these messages in churches? They are there because churches are teaching this as biblical teaching. And so for white evangelicals, there's a trajectory within their history that they laud about what they do with people. But at the same time, that history is predicated upon the fact that Black people are not equal, that Black people are somehow bestial, criminal, mm -hmm. and do all these things. And then you get this moved up into the Moynihan Report and everything else, where we begin to talk about morality. Yeah. And so this is part of what I talk about in my book, because I want people to understand that while people are talking about moral issues, they're also talking about race. Yeah. And you cannot escape that in America. Yeah, I think about, um, from Anthea's point, thinking about this notion of violence and the political. Mm -hmm. right, the way in which the church and the state are not so divorced, right, that the church is, is as you just said, like, is being used to institute state violence, mm -hmm. to advance state violence. And so I wonder how, how you think about that working in terms of the political function um, of the church. Well, <clears throat> I think that I'd, I'd rather start now sure. and, walk, and work our way backwards. So let's think about... Um, J6. Let's think about what, what just took place on the Capitol. Um, the worst attack on the Capitol in American history. And so, um, and motivated by people who actually feel righteous, right? Motivated by people who actually think that they are doing in some ways, not only patriotic work, but God's work, mm -hmm. right? Um, and part of that happens when, um, when, Frankly, uh, uh, evangelical fundamentalists connect so deeply to a political party that they start to move in tandem. And so they lose sight of the work that they were to do for humanity and focus on winning at all costs, right? And that will even sacrifice their own understanding. And I think that for King, he actually saw it as a scourge that, that love and civil disobedience and justice and... Um, uh, uh, nonviolence, that these were actually efforts to save humankind, not just in the United States, but across the globe. And this was motivated by his own spirituality and his own religious practice. And so this idea of violence in the state, certainly in the 1950s and 60s, it was protected. They went hand in hand, right? And so you went to church on a Sunday, but you might also know the person that bombed the church on the other side of town, right? And so these things were not um, separate from each other. And in fact, there was a way that the state was used to protect and to assert whiteness, white supremacy, white power. And we can think about that in policymaking, um, in the institution in the South of, of, of uh, not only um, beginning uh, Jim Crow, but sustaining it and protecting it. Yes. Not only that, but massive resistance after 1954, when uh, states would shut down. We can think of Little Rock, right? All of these ways that the state took action to ensure that that equality could not occur. And that involved violence. And in uh, Little Rock, it involved actually bringing the National Guard to protect uh, segregation, at least initially, right? And so this is the work, I think, of, of the church. And I will say one more thing about this, and hopefully we can get um, to it later. And that is the role of the church in reinforcing um, in telling people what they need to believe. And, and I think we saw it in 2010 with the rise of the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly with the backlash against um, um, uh, the Affordable Care Act, right? So one of the things that, that uh, King also had to deal with, the, um, when, even when he was organizing churches for, for the civil rights movement, the Southern Christian Leadership, Leadership Conference, right? 
because he did not want to be accused of being Mm anti-Christian or heaven forbid communist, right? Because these are ways, right? But these are ways that they pushed people out of engagement, of belonging of their own citizenship in this country. And so King was very acutely aware of that um, in his own work, so. Yeah, I really like the way that you're both building up this continuity, right? So we're 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 talking about the 1950s and the 1960s, but that moves us to the relationship between religion and politics in the 21st century, right? That there is some type of continuum, right, of violence, a continuum of white evangelical Christianity, a continuum of anti-blackness, a continuum of state violence, right? It seems to be a strain right, within the American uh, uh, body. And so I'm wondering how you would talk about where we are now. Where are we now as it relates to this kind of tension between race, religion, and politics? Ready to have another one, six? Hmm. Oh, and I'm not joking. Hmm. I, I mean, I think people, when they hear me say this, they're like, oh, you gotta be kidding, you know, all this. Let me give you an example that is a, outside of America, but the example of why I say this. Bolsonaro is sitting right now in Florida. In Brazil, about two weeks ago, maybe three, the um, people who were following Bolsonaro, who was the former president of Brazil, took over Brasilia and and absolutely smashed up the capital in Brasilia. Beautiful building. Many historical things destroyed. Most of these people were evangelicals. They were evangelicals in the sense of like evangelicals here. And where did they get this from? They got this off of 1-6 because Mm -hmm. Bolsonaro appealed to them in the same ways that Trump appealed to evangelicals here. So what we have is not just a thing that happened in America. You have a worldwide movement of Christian nationalism right now, whether we're talking about Viktor Orban, whether we're talking about what's going on right now in Italy, whether we're talking about the battle between Russia and Ukraine, all of these things come together. So what people forget about 1-6, let me remind everybody, 1-6 1-6 didn't start on 1-6. 1-6 started in December when they had a Jericho march in D.C. Mm-hmm. and the Proud Boys took down a Black Lives Matter flag and burned it. The day of 1-6, who prayed that day? Paula White, Trump's pastor, big prosperity gospel person. Mm-hmm. See, I say all these things because I want to just frame this because, you know, 1-6 was an end But this began back with Bush and compassionate conservatism. What did Bush do back in 2000 when he was when he was running for president? He he smeared John McCain and said he had a black illegitimate daughter. That wasn't a black illegitimate daughter. It was his adopted daughter from India. Okay, so, you know, you've got all these things happening and then you get a black president who gets, you know, basically a commercial that John McCain puts out that shows him as the Antichrist. You get the Tea Party, which everybody says, oh, this is about fiscal conservatism. It was racism through and through every day with pictures of Obama with a bone in his nose and his wife as an ape. I see y'all know y'all, I know y'all are thinking, why is she coming so hard? I gotta remind you. I gotta remind you because you forget. Historians are here to remind you about things. Don't forget, Donald Trump thought about running in 2012, but he's the one that called for Obama's papers. The day that Obama showed his birth certificate because of birtherism, they were killing Osama bin Laden. All right, so y'all forget that stuff. So then when you get Trump coming down the escalator and talking about Mexicans and rapists and everything else, and the Christians are like, I don't know. And then he says two Corinthians and liberty and boy, all of a sudden he is the man. Mm -hmm. And some of y'all who are sitting here watching today who voted for Trump, oh my God, look what you unleashed. Nobody cared if he was grabbing women. Nobody cared about that so-called morality. It was just about, can we make sure that white people and white men in particular stay in power? Yeah. And so this marriage of religion and politics and this fake morality has created a, a dystopian situation in America where Christians don't really care if we have a democracy or not mm. because they just want a king. And who's gonna be king in 2024? Yeah, it might be two two guys in Florida, but we'll see. <laughs> I hope you're wrong. <laughs> I might not be. You might not be. So 
I know we talk a lot about the large ideas and that uh, religion and politics, um, the way the theology informs the way in which we understand um, the world in which we live, how religious ideology right impacts us. I want to talk really on the ground about that. Like, like I want to get at what are the legislative policy implications for this gross relationship between religious religion, race, and politics? Yeah, I mean, first of all, that's a great question, and hopefully we can explore it a little bit more. We've been talking a lot about the federal government, right, the national government. Let's think about states, right? So what is happening in state legislatures? particularly in the wake of uh, Roe versus, the, the striking down of Roe mm. versus Wade, mm. right? And so um, we have seen state legislators talk, bringing religion directly into the work that they're doing as policymakers and framing it as their religious duty, as being called, right, by a higher power to do this work. Not unlike we might have seen in the 1800s, mm -hmm. right, in yep. the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way that the, the debates can begin and end if you're saying God told me to do it. Like, what, how, do, how do we debate that? And so we're starting to see that, I think, at state legislatures, and we're going to see more that is really the claiming of what used to be called the silent majority, right? Mm -hmm. That um, it was uh, 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 conservative Republicans, oftentimes Christian, um, uh, and I'll say Christian fundamentalists. And so I think that there's a way that we need to pay attention to what's happening in, in state legislatures and how uh, religion is infusing some of the norms. Um, I think Missouri has recently said, given a dress code to women, the legislature, yes. legislate, was introduced by a female state legislator, that they should have to dress a certain way, mm -hmm. that they needed to wear jackets, not anything sleeveless, no like sleeveless. the legislating then of women's bodies in public institutions. So this Roe versus Wade, and in fact, not only that, the three uh, Supreme Court justices that Donald Trump was able to put on the Supreme Court because of the inability of, of the Democratic Party to, to, to step in and, and to, to really do the work that they needed to do to replace Antonin Scalia when he passed away. And, and then the three Supreme Court justices and, and the religion in the court itself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And informing the decision-making to roll back rights that had been established in this country for half a century. There is a movement towards Christian nationalism in this country, but there's also a response that I think we, we need to talk about as well. And there are certainly, I think, because this is a conversation about religion and politics, there's so much more than that, right? right. But this idea of really claiming a liberal and just and responsive Christianity that actually recognizes uh, sexu uh, sexuality, gender, race, authority that does not privilege men at its center or power only at its center. There is a movement that is responding to that and going to the courts and making claims. So there is gonna be work that we need to do at the state level yeah. to respond to the work of the, of the federal government. We are going to, we are gonna be in for a wild ride. But can I ask a question? I, mm -hmm. So this has me a little vexed, um, I, I profess to be, uh, Christian on most days, um, <laughs> but I, but I in this moment I might profess not to be right. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about Christianity as being the kind of strong arm mm -hmm. on conservative politics, I don't want to be a part of that. Yeah. Right. So the same thing that that justifies my death, right? That I'm advancing that by subscribing to it. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to be doing that, then I'm not doing Christianity. Right, that's no Christianity I want to be a part of. So I'm wondering about where we might go, and I know this is not our normal code of conduct here, but you know, I wonder where we might talk about the productivity of abandoning religion, insofar as democracy is concerned. <laughs> right? If we're going to have a true democracy, can we have a true democracy 
if, if, if this kind of Christianity, this brand of Christianity is what is guiding us. Well, you're talking as a person who got an award from the Freedom From Religion Foundation, so I'm happy to talk <laughs> about this. <laughs> Which will probably surprise you all. Um, I think one of the things that's really important right now is that we are hitting a point of no return. And what I mean by that is the religious claims that are being made by religious people that are also political claims are, are finding themselves fraught. And this is in many different forms. So we could talk about Christianity. We could talk about a very conservative government right now in Israel. OK, mm -hmm. you know, I know it's a dangerous subject, but I'm going to bring it up. Mm -hmm. um, we could talk about Orthodox, you know, Russian, Russian Orthodox right now up against Ukrainian Orthodox. We can talk about all these different things. We could talk about Islam. We can talk about Hinduism, Hindutva. That, you know, I, you can't go there because I'm sure they'll be calling tomorrow. So let me not even talk about that. <laughs> but here's the thing. We have to start to realize that it's not about good or bad religion. It's about what people are doing with religion. Because I think there's the moral claims that people make about religion that, okay, this could, you could be a better Christian if you do this, or we're not that kind of Christian or whatever. I hate those statements mm -hmm. because what that does is set up this bifurcation that is not the thing that we really need to talk about. What we need to talk about is actually how people are weaponizing religion. Yeah. And, and how that weaponization is used to do political damage and to do damage to certain kinds of groups of people. Because we've always had liberal Christianity in this country. We've always had people who marched. We had people who were, you know, were Christians who were at Stonewall. We had Christians who were wanting to have equal rights amendment. We had Christians in the middle of all of this. It's not just conservative Christians. But the problem becomes when we start to polarize this and say this is good and bad, rather than get at what the power struggle is underneath. And so while in a way, there are things about Christianity since 800 and you know the crowning of Charlemagne mm. that put religion alongside the state, that we have to decide in this country right now, particularly in America, if we're going to have a state religion that is based or a theocracy, or we're going to have people that have to make religious claims. Because remember, what does it say? No religious test for office. Right. But every day, there's some politician who's making moral claims, like DeSantis who said, and on the eighth day, God created DeSantis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. But, but this is the kind of thing that people eat up as a way to think that politics and religion should go together. When a matter of fact, they're terrible bedfellows, but they feed on each other in really horrible ways. Uh -uh. I think that um, I mean we have we haven't talked about First Amendment, right? Separation of church and state. We need to be able to demand that that wall be clearer, stronger. Um, and so, but at the same time, here's the thing: hmm, the tricky piece for me is that um, he understood that uh, there is a way um, that your spiritual foundations or religious beliefs can actually keep you going when other things would make you want to give up. So if you're ever looking for hope, that is one way to find it, right? Yeah. And to keep fighting when, when everybody is telling you that this is going to be impossible. That doesn't mean that that impulse that, that God told me to do it is enough to legislate or to do it for everyone in the country. And, um, and I think that is, that is part of where Americans need to say that this belongs in, in certain spaces, right? In, in my home life. In fact, we need a, a more tolerant kind of understanding, even in our discussion today, right? So King was not only, King, King was very much connected to Gandhi. He was very much connected to religions across the country. We could think about, I mean, across the world, yeah. worldwide religions, right? Yeah. Really focused on humanity and human dignity. And so that is, I think, the direction that that we need to be claiming and moving in. One of the problems, and I'll say this, you know, in terms of politics, is that these strange bedfellows, oh, they are just as captured and caught. So that means that if 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 it's God's guns and the Republican Party, then what are you going to have to do? What are you going to do after that, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is a way that that uh, evangelical 
uh, Christians hold on to the to the to one particular party in this country, and that the party also controls the the, the outlets and outcomes for that yeah. particular group of people. I want to say something else because of where we are, and I think it's really important to say. Let me not just say evangelicals. Let me talk about Catholics mm -hmm. because Catholics are in this too, and right wing Catholics are definitely there. And one of the things that has been the most interesting, if we want to talk about strange bedfellows, mm -hmm. you know, Catholics getting on board with evangelicals, where evangelicals used to say they worshiped, the, you know, they worshiped right. the Pope and they were the devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now because of abortion and we move forward to these other kinds of moral issues, they are together. Mm -hmm. And and so this makes for a very interesting kind of thing. Let's throw in conservative Ju Judaism. You have a lot of different bedfellows here that come across from both sides. But there is one thing that say. The other part of this that makes this a conundrum, at least for me, is, you know, something that I wrote about in the 1619 book, which is Black Church. Because mm -hmm. when you only have one space to do your democratic duty in, which is the Black Church, to fight against racism, to fight against everything else, Black churches were always political. But they were political in a different kind of way yeah. than all these other churches were. And why? It didn't mean that all Black churches were like this. It's, it's very famous to think about King as being the fulcrum to create the Progressive Baptist Convention mm -hmm. because the National Baptists didn't want to have anything to do with how fast he was moving to try to push against Jim Crow and segregation. I think what we have to realize is that religion in America is a complicated story. We want to make it simple, but it's not an easy story. Because when you have to talk about the Black church, which is, you know, the standard statement is made a way out of no way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then we have to understand that religion for some of us was the only space that we could do to exercise democracy. And so I'm going to bring somebody up, else up, one more thing, mm -hmm. who came to Rochester, one of the last places he came to, Malcolm X. Okay? There's a whole trajectory about Malcolm X from going to the nation of Islam to Islam, right? And, and the ways in which his thinking changed throughout all of this. And we tend to not think about that as part of the fulcrum of what's happening with the civil rights movement. But it is because he provided a very interesting space to critique the things that were going on on both sides. Yeah. And I think we need to be more open to really thinking about how our religion situation in America is complicated and why we need to pay more attention to the ways in which religion is being weaponized against democracy and against voting and against people who are right. of different sexual orientation, Absolutely. against gender, against intellect. All of these things are at play right now. And while we sit here today in this room, what is this going to look like in 20 years when they've taken all the books out of the libraries, mm. when we have trans people locked up who can't express themselves the way that they believe that they should? when you can't have same-sex marriage and when you can't have interracial marriage because somebody doesn't believe that because their Bible told them so. Yeah. Yeah. And before we, uh, I'm glad you, you, you went right there because before we get into the Q and a, I definitely want us to talk about local. Yeah. I definitely want us to talk about what is the social responsibility of institutions to actually challenge, right, this stronghold, mm -hmm. this strange bedfellow that is race, religion, and politics, mm -hmm. right? So what, what is the role of our, uh, we're, we're living in a city sweltering mm -hmm. with a lot of things, state yep. violence, poverty, crime, unequal access to education. I can go down the list. What is our role as institutions, not just the university, but mm -hmm. all of these kind of civic institutions? Yeah, I think the first thing, especially for universities, is to realize that whether you know it or not, you are under siege. You are under siege from outside forces that you do not understand that don't even want you to be open right now. Yeah. Because people are really afraid of the intellectual endeavor. And so this is why you have what's happening in Florida right now, where you know basically all the public schools are having to turn in. If you teach about race or you teach about certain things, you can't teach about that anymore. And so I'm wondering how we think about being in the university right now in a climate that, you know, this is a private university, you can still do what you want to do, but what happens when the world comes to your door and tries to get you to change? What happens when things happen in your community, like they're pulling books out of the public library? Mm -hmm. how, how are you present at that, you know, that school board meeting? How are you present when there's, you know, violence that has happened in the city 
either because of some injustice or some police shooting or something like that? How are you present? How are you making this available to students to be able to express themselves in certain kinds of ways? Because see what's happening now is that, you know, there's fear. And the fear is partially that, you know, oh, well, things are going to get out of control, so we can't do this, right? But part of the way we even got African-American studies or Latino studies, Asian-American studies, everything else, came out of protests in the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. That was happening right at the same time of the format and foment of the civil rights movement. You don't get these things unless there's change. And sometimes you got to press against things to make change. And so what I would say here in Rochester, I know the University of Rochester does things here in the community. What more can you do? How can you engage the community? How can you not just be a place that people come to work and leave every day, mm -hmm. but be a place that they see themselves as not just contributing to cleaning or you know, catering or guarding the place or doing something else, but actually as a place that helps them to learn too? No, no I think that's right on point. Um, in terms of uh, social responsibility, um, I think that there is a way that institutions have to res be responsible and responsive for the change that they're actually trying to create. And so it can't be enough. Institutions typically will protect the status quo. So what they've been doing, that's what they will continue to do, right? And I think that um, one of the things that can happen is that demands could come from inside the institution for change. They might come from crises, right? COVID is one of those things, changed everything, upended everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, or it, one of the examples I give thinking about education is nobody asked me if I wanted to stop using overhead. I don't even know if the students know, like an overhead, but nobody asked me if I wanted to start using PowerPoint. <laughs> All of a sudden, everything was electronic and, and the students were like, oh, where are your PowerPoints? Like this is, there's a way that that demand kind of comes and go. They didn't ask my permission. And so, but they built an infrastructure for it, right? They built an infrastructure for high speed internet so that, okay, you can't say that you can't move these documents. So what I'm saying is institutions like the U of R, like these other spaces can build an infrastructure. I think that that is one of the key things. Mm -hmm. The other thing is um, I had students, I live in Indiana, right? So, so a lot of the students were going home for, for Thanksgiving holiday last year. And when they came back, I said, now I know it might be tricky over the Thanksgiving table. I said, because we spent the whole semester talking about why you can't secretly steal an election, understand? <laughs> and that was their end project. Like, <laughs> it is not possible to do. So if you're going to steal it, you might be able to steal an election, but people are going to know you did it because there's not enough secrecy to make this work. All right, so we did that the whole semester and said, so it might make for an awkward dinner conversation over Thanksgiving. I said, but when you go home, you tell your, your parents and your people that you might have gotten indoctrinated, but I didn't do it. The evidence did. Right. Mm -hmm. We're going to indoctrinate you with evidence. Right. This is this is how we're going to move forward. And so that is another thing that I think institutions can do. Yeah. Right. And so you can ensure that that um, people, various streams of people who might not have had access, they need to have access here in Rochester, I think, to, to Anthea's point. So there needs to be spaces. Public education is one of the things that we can do. So how can we make some educational opportunities free and available? How can we make it span across ages from the youngest to the very oldest that we have in our communities? How can we engage people who don't have the resources or don't necessarily see themselves as scholars? How can we connect and engage? And there are fabulous faculty and students here. Not all, the, all of it needs to be volunteer work. That's not what I'm suggesting for everyone because we are also overtaxed. But we are coming out of a season where people have been isolated. And where we, the United States has the highest level of income inequality in history, the world, right? You look at the latest data, the 1% has made more trillions of dollars over during COVID, right? While other people have lost ground. So leaders can help to say, what kind of think tanks do we need? What kind of questions do we need to ask? Where should we put our money that can bring these brilliant minds into leveraging against the questions that we're actually um, facing in our local communities and frankly, in the world, right? This is the work that we can do. And I think it can begin, it ought to begin 
at some place like Rochester. This is exactly the place where it should begin. It should be like a beacon. I say it all, all the time, right? It should be, there should be a beacon coming right out of here. This is a place for you to come if you want to do good work and you wanna actually be able to change the world. It ought to come here from the medical center, from the college. This is the place where it should take place. Right. Now you see why we brought these folks back, right? Uh, it's very um, rejuvenating uh, to, to be on the stage with you. And I know that people are charged, so I am not going to yet read the questions that I know have been submitted. I, I know that there are even much more interesting questions sitting in the audience. That doesn't, not to say these questions aren't interesting, but to say that I wanna give you an opportunity to ask questions where you will. We have, we have about time for about three questions. And so if you have a question, please come to the mic. Hello, good evening. Thank you for your remarks. Um, hopefully you can speak about either the beloved community or Valeria, you mentioned the social gospel. We'd like some, I'd like to hear. Oh yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's it's really interesting because Colgate Rochester, uh, Walter Rochester Bush was part of, of this. And I think it's really interesting to talk about the social gospel. I was just doing this in class last week because part of the interesting thing about the social gospel is we don't talk about it anymore. You know, the word that gets bandied about is like this prosperity gospel, but we don't talk about the equality that people need to have or the right kind of jobs that people need to have. So let's talk about the social gospel in a way that you all can identify with. So you go to Starbucks, right? <laughs> and those people that work at Starbucks are trying to unionize in different kinds of ways. I think Buffalo unionized already, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. So one of the things I would think about the social gospel is how do I help those people at Starbucks to, to move forward in their unionization? We used to have a big union thing. Unions were very religious, folks. This was like something that really happened in this country. When the unions were broken, we broke a lot of wealth in this country. We decimated the middle class because people had good union jobs, they had benefits, they had all of this stuff. And so it's important to think about this as something that we can reinstate, instantiate, to start to talk about how do we take the tenets of the gospel to, you know, do Luke chapter four, basically, mm -hmm. you know, feed the hungry, close the naked, do all this, be friendly to the stranger, all of these things that are in the gospel, and also in the Jewish tradition and other traditions of charity to start to care for those who we need. I know, I haven't been around Rochester yet, but I know in Philadelphia right now, we have too many homeless people. And there's a lot of stuff that is happening on the streets because we have people who have mental illnesses and needs, and they are not being able to provide for, but yet and still, yeah. the government believes that churches are the ones that are gonna do this when churches are tapped out too. Yeah. You can't have the social gospel and just think that, you know, you can make this up and that Jesus is going to come and feed somebody because you need some money. And the government needs to be involved in that, too, which is why our you know standard of living is going down so much, because we have taken away so many services from people. But yet still, we want to say that this is such a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we can go to yeah. the next one. Hello, my name is Desiree Garrick. I'm a sophomore here at the University of Rochester studying psychology and African African American studies. Um, so my question is, how might we engage those who call themselves believers um, on their use of biblical concepts, especially when they're operating in a world of non-believers, uh, especially because there's so many cases where Christianity, um, Christians put their own ideologies with scripture and call it the truth. How do we continue to dismantle this? Mm. That's a great question. <laughs> it's a really good question. That's a great question. Well, I, I, you know, because I'm an educator, I, I think about this a lot. And so one of the things that I always do is I just completely destroy people sometimes because I'm actually a historian, but I do know enough about the Bible to tear them up. And so when I get into these discussions, you know, social media and all this and stuff, I can point them to things that just completely dismantle their arguments. So I'm, I won't give you an example of, of how this goes. One of the things that people always say that, you know, women should not preach, right? You know, when, that women are not called to speak in church. You know, they always do First Corinthians for this and all this kind of stuff, right? And I go, but yeah, but what does that mean that you're not taking care of what you should be if you're the man, right? And so then they get this like kind of craziness and go crazy. But what I try to do with people is to really help them understand that this is a moment in time that scriptures are written. This is about a, a historical document. It's not a document that can be put on every situation in life. 
And so when you get these preachers that say, you know, you shouldn't do this, or the Missouri person who's saying, don't wear your sleeves out, right? I wrote about a whole church that didn't want you to show any <laughs> kind of flesh, okay? <laughs> these are the things that you have to say to people, but you live in this world. You can't make somebody else do something because every other people have freedom and they have freedom to do things. And until we get a theocracy in this country, we're going to fight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is this is one of those things that it's always going to be here. You, We have had this since the inception of this country about people who wanted to impose their religious beliefs on everybody in order to do other kinds of things that they wanted, that they believed were right. Yeah. And most of the time, unfortunately, that ends up in the way that it ended up in Jonestown, right? Mm. Mm. With all these people yeah. drinking flavor aid is not Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to your and that's it. But to your point, right? I'm thinking about this 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 question, which is mm -hmm. a really really good it's question. A very good question. Um, but I'm, I'm also thinking about the binary between believers and non-believers because mm -hmm. I actually don't know that those who may not profess a religious occupation are not actually very religious. And so my, it's the same way that those who profess that they're not racist, right? <laughs> I'm not convinced that they're not anti-Black, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what I find very interesting about your question is that part of what I think is permeating throughout our society is a real investment mm -hmm. in the very religious ideas that we say we don't believe in. And I hear this all the time mm -hmm. at Starbucks, yeah, right? Starbucks. So, you know, like I'm, I'm sitting at Starbucks, I'm listening to people talk, I'm like, I know this person, this person says they're not religious, but everything they just said is very religious, yes. right? And it's, yes. it's that kind of sedimentation mm -hmm. that I think is 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 what's driving this race, religion, politics, yeah. you know, strange. I'll, I'll say it better. One of my, the people who blurred my book, and she's a good friend, Julie Ingersoll, she said, the thing that we have to contend with in this country is that these kinds of thoughts, believers and non-believers, how we put, how you even phrase that question is predicated on the fact that you are framing it like an evangelical would frame it. Mm. And so they're right there. The way you frame the question means that you are already caught by this binary. Great question though. Yeah, yeah. Good but, question, but me, caught by a binary. Let, let me add to it in this way, that, um, there's a way that we, we don't only do this in religion, um, um, canceling, cancel culture, right? Yeah. There's a way that we police boundaries of belonging. And so we have gotten to believe that if you do not adhere to ideals about what something should be like, then you can't possibly be part of what I'm doing right here, right? And so I'm not saying that there are not people who deserve to be canceled. What I am suggesting to you, though, is that there that we have to have also room. There's a way that religion, I think, does kind of come into lots of. I believe in 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 um, second chances, right? I believe in opportunities and change. It doesn't mean that I'm blind to what could happen, but I believe in an opportunity. So one of the ways that I think that this could work is that it's not necessarily a question of believers and non-believers because you're going to fight with believers. Like I, I grew up in North Carolina. I believed in those seven pastors that Pat Roberts, all of those 700 club, all of that. <laughs> that was part of my afternoons in the summer. So I was heartbroken when they turned on Barack Obama, who seemed like a good uh, and, 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 and reasoned person. And they turned on him so viciously. So what I'm suggesting to you that another approach is to ask a question. Right. So when you are engaging someone, the one way to understand somebody is to keep asking questions. So why do you say that? Why do you believe that? Mm. And, and, here, and here's the thing. This is why, because it's important to anybody who is organizing. I do work on coalitions. Anybody who is organizing in coalitions, you are going to have friction. And one of the first things that you're going to do is want to kick somebody out of the group because they're not going to live up to your idea. They're not. None of us are gonna live up to you right, right now. You could say, if you knew this about her, like why is she up there, right? So in, nobody is gonna live up to those ideals, but one way to get through it to the other side is to learn. And one of the ways that we do that is through listening and deliberation. And so you have to have resources. I'll, I'll say this really quickly. Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton, right? In Black Power, everybody needs to actually go back to that book. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that they said is we need to have resources so that we can be conversing with each other as equals, right? Mm -hmm. And so 
I think that in engaging someone who, who is so different that they might appear to be alien, out of space, like I, I do not understand how you can think this way. Not to put yourself in harm's way, but to say, why do you think that way? What evidence do you have? What are you drawing from? What is your life like, right? And then to see, not to forgive or to walk away, but to gain some understanding and to demonstrate, I think, some humanity, because that's where I think that, that we need to be able to move forward. Because yeah. you and, can't convince somebody by telling them how yeah, yeah. ridiculous and, they and, are. And to ask them one more question. Do you have any other evidence in the Bible? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much for your question. Brother. Hello, everybody. My name is Deontay McCrock, and I'm an academic, academic advisor in the Office of Minority Student Affairs. I'm an alum of the university. I'm an alum of DLH. Um, my question is about something you mentioned earlier, hope. So I worked with RCSD for about five and a half years, and I was in crisis intervention. And I think um, it's very obvious that there's something teaching young people in Rochester to not have hope, mm -hmm. right? Not to be able to, not to want mm -hmm. to look forward to. My question is, um, and like the comment you made kind of naturally leads into this, right? As we do the work that matters, right? We have the conversations, right? We're in the rooms where it's happening. How do we reach down and back and out, right? The most, one of some of the most important work that I did was reinstilling values into these young people that I didn't know, mm -hmm. right? You have value that extends outside of what you can or cannot do. And that was concerning because, I didn't have to have this conversation with random people when I was growing up in inner city Chicago in the hood, right? Mm -hmm. People told me all the time, you could figure it out. I promise mm -hmm. you. It doesn't matter what it looks like. And I missed that in Rochester. I wasn't seeing it as much as, and I noticed that there's a very um, kind of intentional connection between really the success of some of the poorest people in Rochester and how they feel about themselves, right? I'm also an advising here. So I work with students directly who regularly express to me, right? I've lost this spark that makes me want to keep, right? Um, and that's a part of the work that I do, right? Mm -hmm. I want to be able to be intentional in teaching. Like this is how we can reset, recalibrate, and get back to you. What is some advice that you all can offer, right? A young advisor or a young person in general, right? Around the desire to want to teach people how to be genuine in care and offering a, a level of compassion that teaches you that your value is not only inherent, but it's important enough that in fact, the next thing you do will make somebody different, right? How do we do that work in ways that don't make us feel the, the effects, right? Some of that abject, right? The stuff we don't want to see. Yeah, thank you. That's such an easy question, Deonta. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to jump in here, but I'm, I'm sure that, that uh, Jeffrey and Anthea will have some additional things to say. Um, first of all, uh, I think that in order to have hope in a thing, right? I think that there's a, a sense of ennui, of despondence, right? Of, of kind of that my tomorrow is not gonna be better than my today. Mm. And, um, and it can be, it can be. People are tired, they are worn out. Um, and that includes young people. Uh, and I think we're going to see it in, in higher education as well. I think we're going to, we are on the precipice of a drop-off. Population, student population is going to shrink in the next decade. And so we're all going to be competing for the best talent. So one of the issues out there is that these young people that we are talking about, I don't, I don't necessarily know it's, if it's about inspiration or about a word that you're going to say, right? But it is about a commitment to ourselves. Here, here, how was King sitting there? I mean, in Boston or in Alabama or in a jail cell, right? What do you possibly have to have hope about under those circumstances? Well, if you don't have hope, then you're not going to do anything at all, right? And so... In, in terms of helping people to see, I believe in empowerment. That is everybody. This is, this is a religious saying, right? What do you have in your hand? What did you come here with? 
because all of us came with something, right? And so what do you have in your hand? What is it that you can do? How can you make a difference? And I'll say this, I believe that service is one way to do it. To be in service to someone else is to actually generate your own healing, right? I do believe that. And that means perhaps to be in service to your own community. So ways that we can facilitate service because you can create creative work actually also, I think, instills that kind of hope. I don't mean to have platitudes right now. Mm. Um, I believe that hope is profound. Hope is something that you do when everybody else is telling you to give up. Right. And so I believe that that work matters. And maybe we need to spend some time, right, really thinking about kind of hope work. Right. What, what, what will that look like? What are the pathways that young people need? And I will say this about Rochester uh, uh, City Schools. They have some of the brightest people and the best talent in the world. You can't you can't compare it. Right. And so these things, the kinds of circumstances that we are confronting in a city Rochester are decades in the making and they are systemic. Right. And money is not going to fix all of it. But certainly providing some pathways, I think, to not just to education. I don't think that education is sufficient for this, right? But something on the ground that says, how can today, this very day, what can we do to help you change your own circumstance? That is empowerment, right? And when we can start to do that, I think it, it helps to to work on the hope, the hope piece of it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about this some more, Deontay. I, yeah, will, I will definitely think about it some more. You got us all a little stumped here because I, I used to, you know, as the president said, I used to give all these speeches, and all of Dr. King's speeches have have hope in them, right? <laughs> and sitting here today, I'm, I'm actually wondering if there's something that we can count on other than hope, hmm. because it feels a little cheap for me. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It feels like America has has given us an idea of hope that is tethered to the very thing that we're very much trying to challenge, right? Mm -hmm. It's like hope in what? Mm -hmm. And I think the point that Deontay made that I, I thought was really good is that there's something intrinsic to Black folk where the hope is in the self, right? And it's it, it's it's recognizing the divinity within. But that is also antithetical to Christian Western Christian teaching, that there is a divine within you. But I want to believe that. Mm -hmm. And I want to actually hold that Afro spirituality mm -hmm. next to my Christianity so that I understand that there is divinity within me. But that's not hope for me, mm -hmm. right? That is a recognition. Hope relies on somebody else doing something else, mm -hmm. right? I didn't mean to preach today, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? But it took me, to, you took me there. And so I, I feel like there is something about recognizing the divine within right, that gets us someplace that we haven't been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, your, your question about this, you know, because so many people are in despair right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that actually helps me not to be in despair, and maybe this is just my orientation, so take this for what it's worth. I think you have to get up each day and decide what is the thing that if you had to die today, that you need to do? What is that thing that you're willing to fight for no matter what? Mm. Is it your family? Is it your friends? Is it something that's there that makes you get up every morning? Because you could just lay in bed. You don't have to do anything. And I think that so many of us see our lives like this, right? Mm. You know, and if you might be a kid in Rochester, you might think this is all there is, right? But, you know, when I was a kid, I started reading a lot and I saw so much more than the world that was in front of me. And I wanted to see it. And I think that we have to get back to some basic things about what it is that is in front of you that you see every day. How do we encourage our students in classrooms or encourage the students that are here to think about not just your moment of this life, but what it might be like a year from now, five years from now. I'll, I'll tell you something personal. You know, in 2019, I was in Morocco and I had a bad fall. And I was like, man, I got to really get myself together because I don't know if I'm going to be able to continue to do this, right? Because I'm I'm older than you, right? And guess what happened the next year? The pandemic. 
shut me down. I'm a person who flies almost 100,000 miles a year. And I went from like everything to nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was outside of my control. How did I make it every day? How did I stay home every day? You know what I watched? I watched whale watching in Maui. I watched, um, <laughs> you know, all these world camps that show people all around the world walking around, like in China and Australia and all stuff, because I was losing my mind in the house. Okay. Now I know this has nothing to do with what you're talking about here, but you got to find that thing that's going to impel you every day to keep going. Because if I did not have that thing, then I would have just been a mess. I mean, it was like for that first year, it was terrible. You couldn't see your friends. You couldn't see it. There's only so many Zoom cocktails you can have. Okay. <laughs> but seeing other people around the world made me think, okay, there's more people here. But you can't just look at yourself as what I'm really saying. Yeah. What I'm saying is, is that you have to connect to other people yeah. because if you're not connected to other people, if you don't have a sense of what you talked about, service, it doesn't necessarily have to be service, even just friendship, curiosity, wanting to know what somebody else is doing, mm -hmm. then you begin to live a life as a real human being rather than this just this individualistic crap yeah. that we have been told that we need to learn here in this country. The civil rights movement was not about people being individuals. See, this is the problem with King. I, I got to go here for a minute. The problem is that you have people who have taken King and lifted him up out of this mm -hmm. movement when there are thousands and thousands of people who were excited. We don't talk about Ella Baker. We don't mm -hmm. talk about C.T. Vivian. We don't talk about all Joy of these Robinson. people. Yeah, Joy Robinson. There are so many people that were there. He could not have done this by himself. He was not an exemplar. Yeah. What he was was somebody who said, I'm going to do this with other people. And if we don't know how to do things with other people, how are we going to keep this world going? Yeah, that's It's good. not just hope. That's good. It's community. Somebody, you asked about the beloved community. Right, right. This that's is it. what the beloved community is. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've mm -hmm. got to have other people. You cannot be alone in this. I didn't come here because I thought it was a great thing to do. I came here to be in community with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why would I come back? Mm -hmm. It's such a big community. Because I know people here. I know. I watch what happens in Rochester. I know the shit y'all been through. I'm going to say it just like this. <laughs> I know what has happened here. And so I believe yeah. that if we have to think about just ourselves, it's not enough to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. We have time for one last question, I believe. And you've been really patient. Okay, thank you. Well, Deontay's question is really hard to follow. So I was <laughs> debating whether I should ask mine. Um, as a psychologist, one of the, the big emerging finds, findings in research is that um, the Republican Party tends to be tends to motivate via fear. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a really quick and easy thing to access to scare yes. people that they're going to be losing things. And the other kind of heuristic that um, I'm hearing in all of this is having a quick and easy way to make a political decision mm -hmm. so that people don't like uncertainty. Right, they right. like quick fixes. They like quick ways of making decisions and scaring them um, or are suggesting to them excuse me, scaring them or suggesting to them this is the moral or the right way seems to be a really quick path to making a decision that you can feel sure about because it relies on other attitudes mm -hmm. that you had that were really mm -hmm. certain. Um, and I was just wondering if you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really true. I mean, it, it, the fear builds into everything about evangelical belief. You know, you, you fear that, you know, the devil is going to get you. You fear the end times. You fear all these things. And so fear is a driver. Mm -hmm. It's also a good money maker. Okay. You cannot leave that behind. I mean, fear generates funds. This is the way I like to put it. <laughs> and so if you have to try to combat what fear is, you have to not only do hope, you also have to give people certainty. Yes. Okay. And you also have to know how to speak about that certainty in such a way that people take get taken care of. So if we use the Affordable Health Care Act, this is a way to make people be certain that they have some health care. Look at what just happened with the pandemic. In this pandemic, we continue to go through. If you don't even have the Affordable Health Care Act, what do you do? That mm -hmm. has given people certainty. But yet and still, now we hear our Republican Congress people saying we want to take away Social Security. You know. Fear is going to be a bunch of old people sitting around, but they're saying, oh no, they're coming for your stuff. They're going to come for your guns. 
They're going to come and get you. You're, you have to protect yourself. We are a nation of fear right now. We have to change this. And fear is the thing that's going to keep us hating each other hmm. because fear is that driver of everything else. So maybe it's not just hope. Maybe it's optimism. Maybe it's about the certainty of certain things that can happen that we can ask our political leaders to do. It is the kind of thing that we can ask religious leaders mm. to stop talking in these fearful tones, to stop giving oxygen and air to people who say, well, God caused that hurricane. Or right. God did this because there were some homosexuals in New Orleans, mm -hmm. like they did right. Katrina, right. you know, right? All these kinds of things that are fear-driven, you need to replace. And, and I say this because here's the other thing that's really important, and I'll shut up. We have an aging population. That is what Fox News thrives on, an aging population who will listen to these fearful things, and that compounds with your age. And basically what that does is it poisons everybody's parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. Okay. And those are the people I feel the most for because they are living in the twilight of the years, but yet these media empires are driving them to the fear of people that they would have never feared before. I used to say when they were real racists, it's like, well, you know, even if you met a real racist, they might let you come to the back of the house and give you a sandwich if you were hungry. <laughs> now you just get shot. Mm. You, you see what I'm saying? There's a difference. There's a difference between the kind of hospitality that people used to give to each other and the kinds of fearfulness that keeps you from that hospitality. Mm -hmm. I, I would add, I, I would add to this that fear is expedient, right? I mean, that, that's what decisiveness is useful when you're using fear as the tool to motivate behavior because you don't get to move very much to your left or right if you think the guy might strike you down or you might go to hell when you're done with all of this so you vote in a particular kind of way or or i mean and, and it's it's also not rational in 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 many ways but think about it that you you trust in god in certain kinds of ways but you gotta have a weapon to protect you just in case God don't come, right? Just in case the angel doesn't come today, I'm going to have to kill some people in the backyard, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, but, but so um, I do think that, uh, and, and we're not only talking about fear, like the kinds of things that occur to me, like the work that I've had to do over the last two years is we are not going to talk about uh QAnon, right? We are not going to talk about things that I, I can't grasp. You do psychology. I, I find it. Now, do I have my share of myths that I believe? I'm sure. But they don't involve adrenal glands or children and pizza parlors, right? And or, or they're, they're, uh, And so I had to tell my students, these are things that we're not going to do. I'm not saying that you can't believe them. I'm saying we're not going to do it in the classroom. Um, but in terms of, of, of kind of how to Think about a political party that traffics in fear because it is expedient. And when decisive decision-making is what people actually want, that was one of the strengths, I think, that came from Donald Trump. And I will tell everybody in this room, I'm sorry, this is this is controversial and, and y'all might toss me out. So whoever was like uh, policing the boundaries, I'm getting ready to step over it. So know that. Mm -hmm. But I think that all of us need to learn, like sometimes I, I tell friends, like y'all need to channel Donald Trump. Like, what would he do right now, right? You don't have to Double be the dance. smartest person in the room to believe that you are, right? I mean, these are, it's true. these are the kinds of things that I think we ought to be able to stand in. And so if you have a party that is going to move in that way, one, I think, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I'm hoping that there's a way that that kind of politics overreaches. I think we're on the cusp of that right now. I hope because right. there is going to be chaos in the House of Representatives for the next year. It is going to be entertaining for political scientists, perhaps, but it's going to be it, can, it has it. It will either be quietly crazy and 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 contained, or it's going to be costly to all of us. Like there's not. I don't. I don't see very much of a right that it, that is going to be either quietly crazy and we can watch it and marvel, or else we're all going to be dealing with the with it in our houses. But what I'm hoping is that that showcase will actually demonstrate. I also think that, you know, some of these candidates, that they are going to overreach. They're going to go too far. And we're going to see 
the nation respond. Hopefully, was it Kansas that responded mm -hmm. on a referendum yeah, after Roe versus Wade? And it was because of a coalition of people who did not agree with each other. Yeah. Some of them responded because of liberty and the others, and they might've been some overlap, but others responded because of a basic freedom and women's right to choose. They might have been not necessarily um, pro-choice, but they believed in freedom. So there are gonna be these ways that maybe we yeah. can come together to say, this is a step too far. Now, I don't know. We have, you know, if we're gonna talk about QAnon, we've already gone pretty far. But, but hopefully there's gonna be an overreach, a, a, enough people in this country. This is a very small set of people. We're in, in, the, in the house itself, we're talking about 40 people in the Freedom Caucus. We're talking about 20 of them that opposed McCarthy and we're talking about five of them that absolutely said no. These are smaller and smaller numbers. And so hopefully we can figure out ways to work in coalition. And they will, I think, I think that they will overshoot. And, and then we can perhaps move in another direction. It might not be pretty over the next two years, though. Well, <laughs> we have not gonna be. covered the gamut this evening. And I thank both our panelists, Anthea Butler and Valeria Chapman, for engaging us, for giving us nuggets to take home and for just being real with us and pushing us as we think about what we can do ourselves with the issues of race, religion, and politics. Thank you both. Uh, let us thank you. Well, I have the opportunity to close this 2023 commitment to redress. It was thrilling to say the least and very uh, invigorating and exciting. And I, I thank uh, Dr. Butler and Dr. Sinclair Chapman and Dr. McCune for uh, engaging us in such a meaningful and informative dialogue. We really appreciate it. I think we all learned a lot. And, um, and Valeria and Anthea, I, I, I really appreciate that you stepped over the line. So keep continuing to do that, all right? <laughs> Um, I, I need to, by closing, to mention that uh, Dr. Butler has agreed to stay around to have a book signing over on the left and uh, her new book, uh, uh, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Check it out. She'll stay over and, and do and participate in the book signing. We appreciate that. Um, I want to just really take a moment to recognize the fantastic work of our interpreters this evening, uh, Rashida Jackson and Denise Herrick. You guys really kept up with our really... <laughs> Fast moving dialogue, we appreciate that. Um, many thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. It's, re it's really wonderful to, to, to be in person again, <laughs> to be able to do it. And I know there are you know, over 300 people are, are looking at this virtually as well. So uh, many thanks to you all for doing that as well. And, uh, and, and finally, I wanna thank the, the many volunteers and the administrative departments who contributed to the planning and the promotion of this event, and particularly the outstanding work of the 2023 Commemorative Address Planning Committee which consisted of a dedicated group of students, staff, faculty from across the university uh, community. And um, I think we should be popping up soon on, uh, I wanna in, uh, encourage people to join the University of Rochester community at the next virtual conversation on February 28, 2023, from 12 to 1 p.m. The topic is antonymizing hate, what is hate and how does it impact health? The speaker will be our very own uh, alumnus, Dr. Uh, Mr. Wade Norwood, class of 85, who's the CEO of Common Health, um, Co Common Ground Health. And so with that, um, this concludes the 2023 20, uh, commitment to address and we look forward to seeing you uh, next year. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you.